Here we go. Hello again. Hi, Jack. How are you? Yeah, pretty right. good. Pretty good. Hey, Angela, you've been here before, haven't you? I recognise uh, your your voice, actually. I have. Yes. Um, I have a question for you at some point. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, um, uh, absolutely. What I'll just do is, um, first of all, was everyone comfortable with um, the Catalyst Circle stuff? Um, any questions regarding that at all? Um, and uh, in terms of what's going on, uh, the most important aspect is that you're actually just aware of it. That's kind of the initial there's uh, been Killer Circle, which was one of the initial sort of setups or experiments with trying to provide some sort of um, a way to bring together all the different aspects of the Cardano environment. Um, so there's a voice and a common common table that was really kind of its initial vision. Um, it is coming up for version two, which is the next election round. Um, so uh, even if you don't um, know of anyone that uh, might be useful for nomination. Um, do turn up if you can on November the 6th uh, at 5, um, 1700 UTC for the election fest. There'll be some stuff going out there and that will give the nominations or the people trying to stand for the circle an opportunity to um, say who they are, give them a sort of uh, pitch and ask any sort of questions. And then uh, as I understand it, voting, will proceed after that. Um, so there were some links in the chat that uh, Felix put in before. If there's any sort of other questions around that um, at all, before we sort of just uh, dive in. Um, yes, is, is bi-weekly every two weeks or is it twice a week? Uh, yeah, the confusing thing, every two weeks. Uh, so the next one will be the 6th of November. Um, just to give us time, some of the rooms like uh, the uh, Japanese and the Vietnamese room actually kind of bring in guests and host people and stuff. Um, I tend not to do that, mainly because the English room is pretty well served. English is pretty well served across um, the ecosystem. So I tend to just run this Q&A and if, if, just discussion sessions and stuff. But if, if you want, to see anything in particular uh, presented, let me know, and we can sort something. Uh, out. Is is this town hall for the eastern town hall, or are we applying for the main town hall, or in like are there going to be? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Are there going to be two catalyst circles, or is it going to be? Uh, there's one just one catalyst one circle. catalyst circle at the moment. It's for all okay. of catalyst at the moment. Yeah, um, so. Uh, it would be good to have a representative from the Eastern Town Hall in there. Uh, you do have to have pretty good familiarity with what Catalyst is and how it's structured, um, how it operates. Uh, so you've participated at least in, say, being a proposer or being a CA uh, involved in like um, the various different town halls, uh, the Eastern Town Hall or the main town hall. Um, and just have a really good sense of what's going on um, in terms of how Catalyst operates. Uh, that's one of the, that's probably the second main requirement for uh, not domination to the circle. Um, one that you can speak English really well. One, you've got a reasonably deep understanding of how Catalyst operates. Uh, and the third requirement is that you can um, spend 10 hours a week and it is compensated. Okay, so um, those are the uh, things going on. Okay, anything else, Angela, in terms of that area? No, thanks. Okay, uh, was that the main question that you had or do you have another question you'd like to talk about? Yeah, I have another question. <laughs> well, let's start with you. Uh, we'll start with you and, <laughs> and see, see um, what, what, what do you wanna? No. I um I'm from Nairobi, Kenya, yeah. um, East Africa. I've noticed that the proposers from Egypt, Sudan, Somalia, Uganda, Tanzania, uh, Burundi, Rwanda, Malawi, Zimbabwe, Madagascar, uh, Mozambique, and South Africa 
are not as involved in the West African Decentralized Alliance. I was wondering if we met here, if we could have a breakout room. Absolutely. Absolutely you can. Um, there'll be no problem at all. Uh, Ken, we do have, so Ken often turns up, he's coming, usually comes in from Mawali. Um, but absolutely, that would be fantastic. If the time zone fits and um, uh, we can certainly add, add a room for you guys. No problem at all. Cool, thanks. Yeah, uh, do you, uh, just send me a message in the chat um, with the contact details and stuff like that. And, um, you know, we can arrange something. Basically, what I would suggest is if you want to, we typically have a sort of planning meeting for the Eastern Town Hall on a Monday. Um, and so that's a good place to come in and just meet um, us as hosts and just sort of discuss the various things that are going on. And that's how uh, we can sort something out. But we'd love to have you on board, Angela. Absolutely. Thanks. Fantastic. Um, right. Anything else on that area? No? Um, Kevin is a new face, or oh, new name at least, uh, that I haven't uh, seen before. So, Kevin, would you do you feel like introducing yourself or, or not at all? I, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, the, um, I have... I heard about this um, catalyst uh, recently from one of my teacher. Um, um, yeah, um, I live in um, Sydney, but I'm actually from Bangladesh. Yeah. So um, yeah, just just wanted to learn uh, about these things. Uh, what are these uh, and what you guys do? All, all those. So I'm fairly new. I don't even know what to ask. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, don't don't be afraid to ask. Uh, even sort of like, what is Cardano or what is Catalyst? Be, be by all means, uh, any of us can discuss yeah. that and help you out. Are you a student? Are you as uh, as? Uh, no, I, I finished my study. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. My teacher is like uh, he was my teacher in 2014, actually. Okay. So uh, yeah, he he gave me um, uh, this uh, link. To join yeah cool yeah okay uh well um please don't be afraid to to put your hand up and ask a question if there's anything that you're not sure of and during this discussions i'm going to get to read and uh, bobbin in a moment because i know bobbin's really interesting <laughs> chafing to sort of discuss some things here <laughs> yeah <laughs> sure, sure. Um, so I was just wondering who was uh, we've got uh, is it Cardano Public Relations or HW who do you want to introduce yourself at all or do you want to say anonymous <laughs> okay was that we're staying anonymous and uh, I saw Joe pop up before as well but she may uh, um uh, dive back in as well. Um, so, uh, Bob and I, and Reed, maybe you two could just give yourselves a quick intro to the rest of the group there and just, just really briefly. And um, Simon as well, maybe you would like to do that if you just go, go around, starting with you, Bob. And... Okay, great. Uh, good evening or good day, everybody. I'm in Melbourne, so it's evening for me. Um, Yes, yeah, so I uh, attended last week's uh, town hall. It was the first uh, formal interactive session. Um, I mentioned uh, last week, uh, I met uh, obviously Robert and Jack and then Rhett. Um, I've uh, had the opportunity to work in Asia, uh, Europe and Africa. I spent some time in South Africa and West Africa, nearly seven years in Africa. So um, I'm pretty much in the sales marketing um, senior executive uh, consumer goods space. So I manage distribution systems and manufacturing and distribution uh, organizations. Um, the last company I worked with was um, part of the Toyota Susho Corporation, which is uh, the large sort of uh, international um, division of the Toyota uh, Motor Corporation. That's pretty much their investment distribution and financing arm. So I was a managing director for Ghana, Togo and Benin. And uh, the subsidiary I actually worked for was a company called CFAO. Um, it's a French 
company that have been in Africa for about 160 years. So they've got um, a lot of business interests across Africa, and I'd say they're probably the most diversified business in Africa. From the point of view that they do, um, obviously they're in the mobility space with vehicles um, and uh, energy, um, pharmaceutical goods, consumer goods. So they're the brand behind a lot of the big brands as well in Africa, like Heineken, and um, they've got JVs with Heineken in some markets and L'Oreal and Bic and so on. So the reason for me being here is to uh, have that sort of small second step interaction um, with Robin and the forum um, on my idea that I'd like to propose, uh, hopefully for Fund 7. That, so that's the background. I hope I haven't gone too long there, Robert, to no, describe that's all right. my that's fine. sort of that's situation. Fine. Yeah. yeah. Reet, uh, do you want to go? Um, any questions, guys, or observations, or just... Sort of or we can come back to it. We'll, we'll come back to it. We'll just we'll okay. dive into right. your stuff later. Uh, yep. after. Yeah, I'll just sort of get everyone so everyone knows each yep. other a little bit. Um, Reet, how about yep. you? Okay. Can I just talk on it? Yeah. Yeah. Are you hearing me there? Yep. Um, uh, yeah, 46 years spent in Southern Africa um, and 20 odd years now in Australia. Um, I... Um, Mechanical engineer, I ended my, ended my years as a senior design engineer. Uh, I had my own business in Africa um, involved with uh, emission control systems and refrigeration. In the last 20 years here in Australia, it was mainly in emission control systems. And uh, these were for companies like BHP, Rio in the iron ore field and the grain industry especially in WA, uh, which has got huge grain, um, well, sorry, Australian grain reserves and uh, exports. Yeah, and uh, recently retired. So um, I've started to investigate uh, the crypto world. And um, uh, yeah, um, I guess I'm sort of a person who gets involved with we are find something a project uh, looking to solve the problems and so my sort of bent is towards um, uh, emissions and things but uh, um, and I've also got something that I want to uh, put together for um, fund seven and um, uh, I've been working on it for a while and but it's still being fleshed out so I'm not ready to sort of broadcasted at the moment um yeah anything any questions from anybody no that's all that's all good if we've got questions and stuff like that we'll jump into it simon and do you want to give a right. quick intro um sure yeah i'm, I'm involved with uh, cardano uh, since since 2018 and as uh, um yeah the last year i i quit my job and started going full-time into Cardano. Um, I think I'm in the community for about half a year now and involved in this town halls pretty much from the beginning. Mm. Yeah, I'm working on, on different projects like Catalyst School, Swarm, um, yeah, it's the town hall. Um, and yeah, I think that's pretty much it about me. I, I, I've noticed the snail shell popping up on yours and Nori's and oh, a few yeah. others. That's, that's another that's another project, uh, climate uh, catalyst, uh, Cardano for climate. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we, since Cardano, you know, prides itself to be uh, very eco friendly, uh, we want to, you know, go further. And I think I think the thing is that is like pretty much the problem of the twenty first century. So, and, and the, the problem really is about incentives, like what are the, the right incentives to, so, so we can, you know, be eco-friendly, but like not, not do it just from the, the ground up and everyone has to, you know, I don't drive my car today because uh, I, I want to be eco-friendly, but do the right thing and be, you know, compensated for that as well. Oh, I, I might uh, drill into that a little bit more later on. Jack, um, 
you want to intro yourself quickly we do it we're doing intros now we, we're doing everyone or yeah do everyone yeah, do everyone it, quickly everybody check. okay um yeah i'm jack as you can see on the presenters square i uh originally came into this space um about a couple years ago i, I mean i've been aware of it ever since you know, Bitcoin came to fruition post GFC. Um, but I've more or less becoming more involved in it now uh, since post 2017 ICO craze, getting involved and just really trying to find my feet in the Cardano area because it more or less aligned with my goals. And I started out as a musician, um, finishing off a degree, not knowing what the hell I wanted to do. So, you know, they say degrees, you get a degree and you get a job at the end of it, but be, music is such an incredibly risky industry, uh, competitive industry with, as well as film and TV that I more or less was like, well, how can I find a way to pay musicians better to give them more of a, to give them more financial security. So that's sort of where I came into Cardano because of its, its principles, it's more egalitarian and digital government and figuring all that stuff out with catalyst and how we finance things is quite is what really interested me and all the DAO stuff and i'm sort of teaching myself everything there is about the voting process now and teach myself haskell um this past year and a half now it's not an easy language um but you know it's a lot easier to learn if you don't have any preconceived conceptions about how haskell is and how to program so i guess there's a there's a, there's a bonus there. Um, and yeah, and just more or less, I've been doing video content for the Eastern Town Hall stuff. I've also been doing content for a, a couple other DAOs as well. Um, tutorials on ex documenting my processes. And I'm also wanting to try and get involved by teaching myself the smart contract contracting language, Plutus. So I'm more or less trying to be all eyes and ears and ultimately trying to wean myself into a smart contract developer at the end of the day. So I'm more kind of trying to understand that's more or less where I am now and where I'm heading and trying to collaborate and just participate, see what happens in this big experiment that we're doing. He, he, he did miss out. Oh, good. He did miss out one thing mm. that uh, he's my son. <laughs> so uh, what? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, that uh, I was going to brag that. I mean, that's quite obvious, duh. You, you sure about that, Rob? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, yeah. Oh, Jack. Jack. No. No. Um, and, yeah. So right. Oh well. Um, not taken. Not for, taken. For Angela and Kevin and um, uh, the others, I'm uh, just very, very quickly. I've been in the blockchain space before there was a blockchain. Um, which sounds weird, but that's because there was this area called financial cryptography, which is where um, blockchains came out of. Uh, so uh, I've been in and around uh, Cardano for, for quite a while. Um, my, really in the last year, got more heavily involved, but uh, I've been watching and tracking it for quite a lot. Um, and I'm from a software engineering background. So that's me. Right. Um, okay, well, Bobbin, do you want to do the pitch? <laughs> well, run through, run through what you what you've got on your mind, and uh, you know how you want to sort of think about. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I've got five slides that are very light. Um, is it worthwhile going through that, or do you think I should just talk through it? You're totally mute, totally up to you. Um, I'll share uh, uh, that sharing options. You should, uh, okay. who can share? Um, do that. You should be able to share now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. One sec. Can everybody see that? Yep. yep. Yes, we can. Okay. So, um, yeah, it'll probably take five minutes and then whatever, uh, I mean, you guys can go for it. It's actually the first time I've presented it, so be gentle with me. Um, but basically, um, I'm looking to reinvent myself as well, use my experience that I've had over the last 
you know, 20, 30 or 25 years, 20 years in uh, sales and marketing and distribution. And of course, my experience in Africa and looking at the opportunities there. So the idea is to create a B2B Africa distribution network. Now, um, as I said, this is the first pitch. So this is going to probably go through, um, you know, 20, 30 iterations, as they say, before we get it anywhere near um, ready, maybe for fund seven. And I take on board your previous comments, Robert, around um, get in there uh, into the fund, present it, and look, if it doesn't work in that, in that round, you can always go for the round after, but it's a learning process. So, so um, I won't go into uh, my background because I've already covered that, but um, in terms of my experiences, I think they're quite relevant for this particular um, proposal, this project. And what I found um, in Africa, um, now, obviously, uh, some of these are generalizations. It does depend on the market, and the Africa is obviously quite diverse. You know, from South Africa, if you look at some of the retailers and the products they have avail available versus maybe a, a DRC, it'd be, it's different, different um, markets and so on. But just as a general theme, obviously, it's emerging, fast-growing consumer goods market. There's a lot of investment going into Africa, um, you know, large corporations, whether it's Heineken or Nivea, and a lot of them are moving into local manufacturing. So obviously there's a lot of interest. And I would say the distribution, um, the physical distribution uh, network on the ground is still very fragmented, developing, and there's a lot of scope for uh, improving the, um, uh, let's say, the effectiveness, the efficiency, the coverage of the distribution network. The consumer market, obviously, given the, the fact that it's, uh, you know, 54, 55 countries, still very fragmented, depending on the manufacturer and the brand, they go into different markets, they could be focused on East Africa, Southern Africa, West Africa. And what I found is that the uh, route to market can be quite expensive. So often, there's a number of players in the chain that are taking their margins, it could be agents, or could be, um, you know, the different uh, players. And, um, because of the risk, they often take quite high, um, high returns, so high margins to cover their risks. So the end products often available to the consumers can be quite high and substantially higher um, than maybe some developed markets in other, in other countries, uh, in other continents. And obviously, there's a large offshore uh, onshoring opportunity in terms of local production. So that, that's the context. So... I think the problem definition, although it's not um, defined from a technology point of view, it's more from a commercial and business point of view. And I guess we can talk later on um, and in future, I guess, sessions about how the technology can support it. Uh, but I've found that the choice for African consumers is generally much lower in terms of products on the ground and particularly the pricing of those products due to the high margin. So just to illustrate, um, if we look at, let's say, and this is again a generalization, but if you look at Africa on the left, if, you, you know, if you've got premium goods, broad product offerings and commodities, um, at the very top end, because there is a lot of money at the top end, some of those really uh, expensive brands could be a little bit more expensive in Africa versus maybe the West. But in the broad product, the mainstream area, that's where I think there's a big issue and a big opportunity from the point of view that the number of goods that are available vis-a-vis -vis developed countries is lower, but the price, as reflected by the size in this case, um, is much higher. So you may take, a, you know, let's say a box of cornflakes. You may, you may for the same, you know, like for like basis in a lot of the African countries, uh, if it's imported, it'll be substantially higher. And similarly for commodities, I mean, uh, I haven't done um, a lot of the cost analysis and that, but there could be probably a little bit uh, similar pricing. So I think the core issue here is, aside from um, a lot of the trade, the non uh, sort of non-tariff barriers and so on, and the logistics complexity, one of the core issues is low competition. And if we can increase competition, then, um, sorry, high competition, low competition, but if we can increase competition, then uh, we can reduce the prices. So what I thought was core idea was to develop an African distribution network focused on in the consumer goods space and create a B2B solution for the African continent. Um, the solution would be in part, this is the first sort of cut of that, increased competition in fast moving consumer goods se a sector across Africa. 
um, by accelerating the availability of products from local and international manufacturers. Now, there could be an, uh, a stronger emphasis on local support because that's one, I think, one key area in Africa that um, can, um, uh, let's say, reap the rewards of the benefits. So, for example, if you're manufacturing something in Zambia, you could push it in through to South Africa or Zimbabwe or um, uh, Botswana across that Southern African space. So that way, that way the local manufacturers would benefit. Um, and the purpose of that would be to drive um, the uh, prices much lower, increase competition, drive prices. Now, how do we do that? Um, this is only one piece of the puzzle, but it would be to create um, a database um, for manufacturers and importers where, um, I mean, we'll get to the technology side of it. We create a database of brands, manufacturers and importers and a similar database of distributors. We would then um, work to match them and support them to develop across the African continent. For example, you may have manufacturer X in Ghana um, and then we by, joint, by linking them to distributors in Togo, Benin, Nigeria, Mali, Burkina Faso, Ivory Coast, we can then expand the availability of those physical products in West Africa, for example, where there's 400 million uh, consumers. Um, and then build Pan-African connections and then through that network, provide a lot of val value added services. So what I thought was, um, I've been involved of sort of uh, looking at Cardano and this, all the technology solutions and probably in the last six months or so, was to look at how the uh, solutions that the Cardano platform has could support this project from the point of view of, uh, you know, the digital identification, which would be um, uh, generating the, da the digital database or identifications of all the brands and the manufacturers and the importers across Africa, as well as doing the same for distributors, because in the African space, you've probably got, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of distributors, you know, from North Africa down to South Africa. And, um, and then uh, there are other solutions like traceability. So if, you've, if you're taking um, cocoa from um, uh, Ghana into another market, you can use that or internationally for that matter, um, using smart contracts to facilitate the B2B relationships. So that uh, they can almost do a technology leap in terms of all the paperwork. And then maybe even integrate payment systems into that, um, into that uh, platform to um, facilitate smooth, seamless um, payment of goods from one manufacturer to another um, across the space. So that's sort of it. Um, I didn't want to get into any more detail at this stage. I think, uh, I hope I've given like a broad overview of what the idea is. But obviously, there's a lot of granularity that needs to come through, especially on the uh, technology side. And obviously, if I was to put this proposal uh, together, it would be substantiated by a lot of, um, uh, you know, number crunching in terms of macroeconomic information, number of distributors. I mean, a lot of the metrics would come, come into play as well. So that's, that's five minutes or seven or eight minutes, I think. Uh, but uh, putting it out there now, and um, please yeah, let me know what your thoughts are. Right. Thanks for that. That's uh, that's really cool. Any uh, questions or anything that people want to uh, go up, Bob and have in yep. terms of what he was saying? And before I dive on in as well, I've yeah, got go I've got it. lots of suggestions and ideas. Yep. But uh, yep. I'll be interested in anyone else. Like, good to see you, Stephen and and Tivo yep. and Jan, um, Juan. I I think uh, I think it's a good idea if. Um, to local manufacturers in, in Africa. Um, it tends to, yeah, it's, it tends to be something that uh, is not really pushed by the people who supply the money, I suppose. Um, and it's also, it's also difficult to maintain if, if, if it's not, I suppose, well supported. But yeah, I think uh, local manufacturer would be a good thing. And um, uh, getting rid of the US dollar, I suppose, and its inflation and stuff like that would also be good. So, yeah, um, it's not a bad idea. Just That's getting right. the I stuff mean, made and, 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 and getting the raw materials and um, expertise. I mean, I haven't 
I haven't seen what happens in, 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 in West Africa, but in Southern Africa, um, they are facing the decolonization. So there's a lot of things that are going wrong, uh, not saying going wrong, they're just becoming decolonized. So you're having problems with power and all the rest of it. So for manufacturers, it's always a bit of a problem if you don't have have good power and but i mean these are this is just a managing the, managing the, the main thing here Ed, is the uh distribution network aspect of it um yeah. and the ideas of any sort of distribution network is actually to handle those sort of problems um in terms of uh, either smooth them out or be aware of them and and uh, essentially if i understood you correctly here bob and is what you're actually talking about fundamentally is a matching market is that correct in terms of matching yeah. the because of the B2B side of things, you're trying to find that the retailers versus the suppliers and matching them across lots of different uh, criteria. Would, would that be a uh, kind of quick summary of it? Um, yeah, although just uh, there is basically four um, pillars, manufacturers, the brands, the distributors, the retailers and the consumers. So I, I do recall even um, Charles saying B to B to C. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're right. The initial project would be a B to B, which is the manufacturers and the brands go and the distributors matching them. So you're right. It's a matchmaking of brands and distributors so that they can act as a, um, a catalyst for um, a coverage and distribution of all the great products that are available in Africa and internationally through the African space, through this matchmaking platform and all the other value added elements that come with it, which I'm sure you know, you've got a lot of the sort of opinion about as well. Yeah, yeah we've got lots of, always got lots of opinions. <laughs> <laughs> um, Angela, I'd be interested to know in terms of you're on the ground, your experience, um, and essentially the question here is, uh, the idea that wider choice, lower prices of, is really the heart of uh, the proposition, the long-term proposition of what Bowen's getting across. Um, any thoughts in, in terms of what he was saying? Um, plenty of thoughts. <laughs> um, where my mind has gotten kind of stuck with the idea is just the basic infrastructure between countries. How would you be <laughs> transporting goods or services across? You know, there's a big physical barrier to the actual infrastructure in a lot of the parts of Africa. So um, I would suggest breaking it down and, and working on like three particular countries that you're gonna try it first in and then seeing what happens with uh, you know, can you actually move goods across these borders? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, it's, uh, sorry, um, Angela, was there anything else or would you, would you no. like me to respond now? Yeah, I Go think right you, bring, you bring up, oh, yeah, thank you. You bring up a, a key point which uh, relates to uh, the challenges of trade across borders in Africa. And, and you're right, we would focus in one area um, that potentially I know quite well, um, or the others know, because uh, the key part of this, uh, it's not um, my project. And we, we brought that up last time, Robert. It's like, uh, what team can we build on the ground in Africa? And I've certainly got a lot of connections that can work on this project in a collaborative, open way. So. Uh, but yeah, we would we would start maybe potentially East Africa or West Africa um, and move from there. Now, it would be an early mover project from the point of view that you have now the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. There, there are a lot of physical challenges, but um, the purpose of this um, uh, platform uh, would be to, to um, help, you know, um, companies work through those challenges. We wouldn't be, you know, dealing with, um, you know, bilateral trade between two countries. I mean, they have to sort that out and logistics and so on. But um, maybe the, uh, the whole platform itself can be a catalyst to bring up the issues to the relevant stakeholders in the governments in order to, um, uh, to bring those uh, barriers down so that goods can flow across a lot of the African markets. And if that happens, then 
I think um, a lot more consumers will be, a lot more products will be available to a lot more consumers. And I think if we succeed, you know, five years down the track, um, it could be a, a, a um, let's say, um, a network that can influence governments to, to allow products to move. So um, I guess there's a lot of, a lot of opportunities, but point, points taken, I think, um, that need to be worked with uh, in the space for sure, the challenges exist. Yeah. yeah. Um, Juan, did you want to uh, ask any sort of questions or anything? Because there, uh, um, uh, uh, in terms of your, just say your question in the chat, uh, this room is being recorded and it will go up on uh, YouTube, but, but if um, uh, Bobin wants to, have you got a link, uh, wanted to share those slides or anything else like that, by all means. Um, but one, did you have any specific questions? Um, any feedback or anything? Okay. Um, TiVo, 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 TiVo. Now, um, Bobin is basically, you know, wanting to, Put it start think he's he's already starting to think about for fund seven all right so um you know in terms of putting in proposals and stuff like that uh i take it you saw what he was running through briefly there now since you are um in the sort of mini proposal sort of things any thoughts around preparing this for for fund seven mm. Well, from the last point, what Boban said, my my first impression would to create like a edge shop for these local environments, and you collect data what people want, and from that you create like a uh, a list of products you want to build locally, and then the fun starts where you start building the P two P and like distribution networks. Mm, I, I wonder, and, and, and from the AVG talk, um, I was thinking more of an Africa side. So I like, I guess we could try some, like, well, I don't know, maybe it's too, too big a dream, but I feel like building a mini factory, like 3D printers, something like Elon Musk does, but like fully automated to some products what are like, mm, oh, everybody wants, but it, it has, doesn't have the natural resources on Africa itself, or it's cross borders in the places where they're like, not so easy to get, then maybe there is a way to find some, how to say, uh, like different materials to build the same thing, but they're unique to Africans because the local, the natural resources are different. Um, yeah, but if, overall, I, I do like the idea and like yeah. thinking yeah. about these markets. Uh, and I think it's quite interesting to like draw this stuff out where to get stuff and. Right. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, the the big plan, Bobbin, is large. Mm -hmm. First of all, large, and that's you know good. And obviously, you're not gonna. Uh, it's a you're gonna be doing over steps. I think I'm stating the obvious there, but um, the aim is to build a network. Would that be correct? A network to facilitate uh, fast moving consumer goods across Africa and build that out over the years. And yeah. at the heart of that is basically the idea of uh, a blockchain to facilitate or what we would say is lower the transaction costs um, of transporting goods um, and, and getting them to where they need to be at the right time. That's um, the core. So I, I thought I'd just try and answer some of the questions in your last slide there. Um, maybe you want to throw it back up again, the very last one again? Yeah. Um, yep. And I'll just um, run through a few things. Uh, Simon, I'm going to ask you a few questions later on about this uh, with respect to, um, you know, the climate related things and some of the stuff you were talking about. Can you guys see it? Sorry, Robert. Uh, no, it hasn't popped up. So, but if yeah, you sorry, want to... I, I also had a question to um, yeah? Um, yeah. So I saw you wanted to use digital ident identity for the project. Like how, how would you use that? Or... Would, you, would that be on the consumer or the business side? Or? 
Uh, so I was just going to talk about that, Simon. Um, so actually, uh, oh, yeah. Perfect. So yeah. we'll just uh, pull that yeah. up. Um, um, Robert, can I can I just say something in yeah. response to your last comment before we move on? Um, so uh, bringing cost cost of uh, cost to serve or distribution costs down, the primary um, driver of that would be the manufacturers and the distributors. So uh, this would be like you said, a platform or a network where we can match them um, and then uh, basically connect, you know, as many markets with as many brands where the opportunity, back to what TiVo mentioned as well, where the opportunity is, exists. We could do some opportunity analysis in terms of which categories, which products, and we can work back from there. And we can feed that through the platform, um, through the to the distributors and match make them and then um, sort of uh, increase uh, the, the platform a bit by bit, yeah, so. Um, on the digital side, I'll just answering Siamon, um, it's, it's not digital identification from a consumer point of view. It's, merely, it's more from a B2B point of view at this stage, which is on the, on the platform having all the distributors. The scope of this is quite wide. I mean, you may have, you know, 50,000 manufacturers of consumer goods in, in Africa, um, and you may have five, 10,000 distributors in Africa. So, you know, matching them across the, you know, the whole continent uh, is quite a big exercise, as Robert mentioned, yeah. Yeah, so um, because in terms of how can Kadano and I th hopefully this will also help uh, Kevin understand a little bit about some of the technology that Kadano actually offers uh, in terms of what's happening. First of all, um, did, so we've got four things that you've got pointed out there, which is digital identification, traceability, smart contracts and payment systems. Um, there's probably a third one in there, Bob, which I'll be really interested to know about is financing. Mm -hmm. uh, what is financing in this context? Um, what role does trade finance have in this context? Um, certainly, I can see in terms of local manufacturers to local uh, wholesalers, uh, retailers, there's probably a need to um, improve trade finance on the side of things. But even internationally, there's probably quite good opportunities there. But I'll touch on the things at first. Now, um, you've got up there, build a database. Um, in many respects, uh, a, a blockchain is a database. Um, it's a particular type of database whereby we can trust the facts that are put into it and anyone can update it uh, notionally. So that's, uh, as long as they stick to the certain rules, anyone can really kind of update it. So um, uh, you off, Jan, Jan uh, Juan, sorry. Um, Nice to see you. <laughs> uh, hopefully you come back again <laughs> sometime, but we'll see, thanks for turning up. Um, so yeah, um, in many respects, it is a database, just a different type of one than most people think about when we talk about it, an SQL database or, or one that SAP might use, SAP may use, for example. Um, so what we've got here are base level facts that we can trust. All right, that's the key idea. Um, so in a sense, digital identity and the notion of build a database or, um, of suppliers and manufacturers and importers um, actually is the same question, right? Um, partly you want to try, you're, you're essentially wanting to give them some way to identify the different parties in the system, right? Yep. Now, um, there's several ways to do that. Uh, and I'll, for the moment, I'll just ignore the onboarding aspect of it and the verification and, and other sort of things that may go along with it. But in a nutshell, you could really, in a really, really basic sort of way, you could say, well, actually every importer and every manufacturer has a wallet, right? Mm -hmm. In which case they've got an address in, in uh, the Cardano blockchain, which means they've got an identifier. Now that's a pretty naive and rudimentary thing, but it's actually the basis of what we can do here. Um, fundamentally, identity itself is an emergent property of the interactions of participants in a network, okay? Rather than identification, which is what you've got here, which is basically giving a name to something to say, hey, this is importer X, this is manufacturer Y. Um, now, uh, so we can certainly do that with wallets, but in addition to that, 
if we want that digital identity to import with other entities that are one, either other blockchains or um, companies which are non-blockified, so to speak, or governments, then that's when we start talking about um, the claims-based digital identity systems like Atala Prism, which is the um, uh, technology that is about to be rolled out at some point in Kadana, but it's been, IOG has been working on it for a little while. That's the basis of the technology where they're issuing credentials to school children in Ethiopia, right? Um, the primary vehicle for a teleprism is, or market for a teleprism is government agencies issuing things, but the technology itself um, is general. It can apply to um, things just as much as people, just as much as legal or natural persons, okay, depending on your status. The technology is relatively neutral with that respect. And there's two primary pieces of technology here. One is called a DID stands for digital, digital identifier. Um, and um, uh, the other one is um, the verified claim stuff. I and mean, both of these are standards. The verified claims is the key piece of technology here. Uh, that does things like wraps, it's a container for information and it will wrap something. Um, so for example, a school qualification. It wraps that, um, but it can easily be a, a business document that might be required in the consumer goods sector for, you know, way bills and those sort of things, you know, shipping things and stuff like that. Um, so it basically wraps it. Um, and by wrapping it, I mean that um, it, you know that it's been issued by an authority. And I don't mean government when I mean authority, it's just that there's someone that has got, we believe, or we trust to be able to issue that statement. Okay, generally that might be a government, but it could be a port authority. It could be a board across it. You know, it could be any form of inspections or anything else like that. Um, because obviously as goods move through a supply chain system, there's all sorts of compliance or reporting requirements and stuff that go along with it, right? Um, so, and if we're going cross borders, if there's a local manufacturer in uh, Moali and we're wanting to send something down to uh, uh, South Africa, um, then basically we're going to go through multiple countries. Uh, there's, we want to make sure that that, uh, that thing, whatever the, the goods turns up is the thing at the end. Okay? And that dovetails into traceability solutions. So the digital identification and digital identity technology work with that. Now, in principle, you could use just the blockchain to do everything, and that's fine. You would only use a Tala Prism when you needed to interface with other technology, other uh, organizations that aren't blockchain aware. Right? So you can actually do quite a lot just in the base level technology stack. Um, Payments, um, right, uh, I might touch, because smart contracts are the enabling technology, which enables us to implement business rules, or more specifically, business collaborative processes. So if we view the supply chain as a collaborative network, which is trying to get goods from A to B uh, through various different stages, a smart contract, or smart contracts more specifically, uh, can, um, orchestrate a lot of that business process for us, okay? Um, because largely what they are, are little scripts that produce facts, or in this case, in the Kadana network, they're actually little scripts that verify things have been done, okay? Um, and we can do a whole lot of stuff off chain um, that then admits little facts back onto our network to say this step in the process has been done, that step in the process has been done, this one's been done, hey, it's been delivered, release payment, okay? So um, now this opens the door, as I mentioned, to all sorts of different forms of insurance and finance, okay? Yep. Uh, because if you've got a good way to identify the endpoints and the things that are going on. You can then build up traceability to say that it's gone through these different steps. 
which means that you can enforce those steps of follow through a consmark contract, which in turn then releases payments and can be predicated on different forms of financing. Yeah. As a rough hey, Robert, just, yeah. yeah. So just, just on that, yeah. um, you mentioned reducing the cost of the products. Um, actually, uh, there is a, I mean, a great way to contribute to that by the whole financing string, you know? Mm. I mean, in Ghana, for example, when I was there, the cost of financing was uh, 17%. Imagine that 2 to 3% of the margin on a monthly basis, just on that, not to mention the currency volatility and all the other macroeconomic stuff, inflation and so on. So uh, I, I go back a little bit to what I mentioned earlier on. Yes, indeed, you guys are right. The cost of the products can come down just through the uh, very efficient financial transactions that hopefully one day can be uh, integrated into this. Hmm. Uh, how, how, uh, how heavily are letter of credits used within um, cross continent um, transfers of goods? Um, I would say a fair, fair degree. There's bank guarantees. Um, mm. uh, there's a range of different, I mean, the market's so big, depending on the players, there's a range of different uh, solutions, yeah. And are there, even, um, um, are there significant uh, manufacturers there as well that have um, low capital costs? Um, well, the, um, um, there are a lot of manufacturers there, but in my experience in, in let's say Ghana, the um, the running operating costs are quite high based on the cost of financing. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I feel like I said, seventeen percent, you know, 15, 16, 17 percent um, operating costs there. So if they've got, um, you know, we're not even talking just in time systems and all this sort of stuff to reduce the inventory, therefore reduce mm -hmm. the running costs and the capital, but. Um, I'd have to do a little bit more analysis on that in terms of just where the where which parts of the chain are more expensive and how they can be liberated by this uh, let's say um, this system the new system that we can create. Yeah, so one of the things here, the reason why I'm sort of asking that is, um, so you've worked for Toyota Tasu Corporation, which I presume has a pretty because of their size has a pretty low capital um, cost, working capital cost relative to say a small manufacturer um yeah uh, like um and therefore because they've got access to the capital markets and stuff and yeah, yeah. well um i i uh, worked for a hundred a subsidiary which is 100 percent owned a french subsidiary uh which is local and then we we um we get the uh, financing on a local level but it is through an international bank so yes we do get favorable uh, rates, but it's uh, it's still crazy rates. I mean, it's not like two three percent. We get the seventeen cost of financing would be, and the money we get from the local bank, which is a a branch of the international bank, would be three four five percent lower than maybe other um, manufacturers that are similar to us in size and scale and so on in the local space. Mm. So yeah, we do get some advantages, but. Um, the local operation bears the brunt of the um, of the, the the funding that's provided by the local bank, Societe Generale in Generale in this case. Did that answer your question, Robert? I'm yeah, sure yeah, I... it does. And and the yeah. uh, the compliance cost of the guarantees or the ELCs and stuff like that pretty high. Well, they're all managed uh, centrally um, by our head office in Paris with the Société Générale head office. Um, I mean, the two, because they're both French um, operations based in Paris <clears throat> with um, subsidiaries, fully owned subsidiaries in the markets, they do a lot of that behind the scenes financial negotiation at head office level. We just, yeah. see, the, we just see the outcome of the negotiation in terms of uh, the local rates. And what, what about the um, level of corruption within the supply chain? How high, low, significant, you know, is it? Well, that's that's a big issue. Yeah, that's a big issue. Um, I mean, the, there's all sorts of blockages um, and that's the big challenge for, for Africa and the uh, African continental uh, um, free trade area agreement. Um, so is to try and, um, you know, liberate the movement of stock across borders. Um, so, yeah, on paper, and that's it's moving forward, you know, step by step, but there's still a lot of work to do in terms of changing the reality on the ground. For example, moving a container from Accra to Lagos is the equivalent of moving a container from Hamburg to Accra. Um, you know, now, now it's even gone crazy, but uh, I guess with this platform, 
it is, like you said initially, Robert, a matchmaking uh, platform to start with uh, because it'll develop in phases. And my, I think there'll be a huge commercial advantage once we generate some scale across uh, the African space um, for local uh, manufacturers that want to grow within their region, you know, African enterprises that are producing chocolate in Ghana but want to move to, you know, 15 other countries where they can't find distributors. So we can, we can do a lot of that good local um, uh, manufacturing and distribution development through the communication that we have. Obviously, we won't do the, we're not going to do the box moving, but we're going to facilitate a lot of the transaction. There are a lot of other value-added services, as I mentioned here, which could be promoting local, promoting green, um, you know, and obviously there's a whole traceability stuff. So, uh, but uh, it can be monetized from an international point of view. So if you're Nestle and you want to um, move into, let's say, although Nestle is already quite developed, but other, other, let's say, tier two global operators that want to move into the African space, you can say, well, look, we've got a network of, 10, 15, 30, 100 distributors that we can um, negotiate, uh, you know, with uh, on, on our platform. So yeah, well, one of the interesting, the since, since you brought up Nestle, um, and I know that they do this, so I'll just, um, I'll, I'll riff a little on um, the potential or the opportunity here, is once, mm-hmm. once you've got some reasonable notion of identity, or, and I, of your suppliers and manufacturers and some you know, sort of systems working, you can introduce some things like um, uh, financing, things like reverse securitization. Now, Nestle already do this. Um, and that's why I was talking about the access to low cost capital, uh, mm-hmm. which is for people that aren't familiar with the idea of reverse securitization. It's basically most companies, large companies and stuff pay on a um, pay supplies and things on a 90 day terms. Um, very often, but often those suppliers and the other uh, people in the different supply chains um, have um, much higher cost capital. Uh, so Nestle fine helps finance them by basically saying, "Hey, we'll, we've accepted this invoice, right? Rubber stamped it, but we won't pay you for ninety days. Ninety days, but we, we will pay it, guaranteed to pay it." And that means that they can then go off to lower cost factoring and other sort of financing solutions to finance the, the cash flows of the companies. And it just frees up a whole lot of sort of things that are going and brings the cost down overall. So Nestle has been doing that. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure to what extent they've been doing it in um, uh, Africa, but I know they've been doing that in Western Europe. Um, so that, that's an example where just bringing those sort of costs down, once you've got a sort of notion of identification of who your suppliers are, you can reduce their overall cost, working capital costs um, through mm-hmm. the sort of technology. Yeah. A third component in here is that, well, okay, we know there's financing solutions which are triggered uh, by various different stages uh, within the supply chain, um, you know, whether it's landed, whether it's you know, on a truck or anything else like that. Um, there is opportunity really to, uh, again, once you've got a decent form of identity and traceability going on, you can actually then start to open up that financing uh, to the network. And by the network here, I'm saying actually, um, you know, the Kadano network in this case, people can pop Mm -hmm. in and, and actually finance. And so if your cost of cost of capital is like you're saying 5% or higher, then um, bring it down a, a few hundred basis points is going to be significantly, a big significant improvement in terms of cost. So, you know, bring low the prices down. Um, mm-hmm. the, the other aspect there though, um, going back more to the idea, initial idea of just the matching market. Um, this is actually the idea of trying to get goods A, um, to find a home, so to speak, and with a retailer or whomever at some point in time. Or a distributor, and, yeah. Yeah, distributor, retailer. They, and there's various different steps that they've got to go through in order to do that. Um, one of the ways to actually try and lower those costs down, and um, I use the term matching market because this is actually an area of economics, uh, which I do quite a bit of work in, um, which mm-hmm. is basically the idea of combinatorial auctions. So you say, I need to ship this box, these boxes of goods from A to point B. Who's going to bid? And there's multiple steps. Who's going to bid on them? Okay. 
And, the, the, and that's particularly for the logistics side of things. And that was the question to do with corruption within the supply chain. Because one of the things here is there will be, if you impose some sort of, um, and please push back on, on this, uh, what I'm saying here, but um, if you were to try and impose sort of things to try and root out the corruption and stuff, you'll get pushed back, right? People will push back on that. If you try to bring, you, if you go in and say, hey, we're using a blockchain and everything's uh, traceable now, and we can see there's so much transparency in this network. Mm -hmm. And people might go, hold on a minute. Oh, we don't like the sound <laughs> of that. <laughs> um, yeah. My yeah. Po pocket's going to be hurt and you'll find huge amounts of resistance. <laughs> yeah. And this is actually not uh, a theoretical exercise because that was actually shown with M-Pesa when they deployed M-Pesa into Afghanistan. Um, and they first did a deployment into paying the police. And they couldn't no. understand why the police weren't picking it up. You know, to, it was a payroll approach with the M-Pesa yeah. equivalent. Um, and they worked out it was because... Um, all of a sudden, the police that were receiving their actual pay thought they'd got a 30% pay increase. Because hmm. there was so much graft in the system that, you know, the higher ups, their managers hmm. and things were pocketing stuff. And so they were resisting the deployment of this technology because it meant they lost out. Hmm. Um, and the actual police on the ground got paid what they were supposed to. And arguably, some of the things that the Taliban managed to overtake uh, Afghanistan Afghanistan so quickly was because there was so much graft within the military um, there that they just said, well, well you know, hands up. So yeah. my, my point, broader point here is that um, that market mechanisms can actually help with corruption, not so much because, um, uh, you know, you're bringing in transparency, it's because it's beneficial if you design them well it's beneficial to be honest yeah and look there are a lot of um, players uh, you know in the african space that you know large um, african um, organizations and internationals that want to do the right thing in the right way so there they'll be um, uh, you know pushing that uh, sort of uh, agenda let's say the initial step would be the matchmaking and then Step by step, you could get into other commercial uh, services or so on. But um, uh, yeah, I guess that uh, the fact that everything's traceable would be uh, uh, quite advantageous for the whole network, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So one of the um, things I'm just thinking about your yeah, Fund 7 proposal now, put that my head on here, um, mm -hmm. is that you, know, you want to kind of break this up. You know, there's a, there's a big vision but then you've got to go through and actually break it up into smaller proposals and bite-sized things. Yeah. And one of the things, so fundamentally what Catalyst is, is a um, innovation discovery platform. There's a, a way of describing it, right? We are actually trying to figure out what um, utility this blockchain thing has. You know, this piece of technology, how can we use it in what markets under what context? Um, and so we've got to figure out what uses make sense. Um, and uh, it's also, as a result of that, as in its current form formation, is really just sort of seeding those experiments. Okay, So we're just doing small experiments to figure out what works and what doesn't. Um, later attempts will probably try to say, right, well, now you're bigger, let's fund bigger efforts. But also this particular, your particular problem um, actually fits really nicely with uh, having some of its own sort of token system. Uh, mm. There's actual real utility and real value in doing an FM, uh, fast moving consumer goods network in Africa. There's mm. real utility there. Um, so um, the, uh, the thing for your fund seven proposals is not to try and uh, certainly pitch the, bigger idea, but then break it up into smaller chunks of things that you could um, test out, first of all. Um, and mm. I saw TiVo was nodding earlier before, so I presume he's in agreement with me on that one. <laughs> um, and, and one of the things I would, I would look at is really the starting point here is to explore and try to understand that digital identity aspect. 
what can you do mm -hmm. to try and bring on to do effectively build this database of brands and manufacturers? Um, so there is a um, challenge setting called the uh, it's a, a Tala Prism did, did challenge or something like that. Um, that's in the fund six, most likely to be in fund seven as well. Um, that would be a good example of what would it take to uh, uh, develop a um, deploy a Tala Prism for FMCG um, manufacturers, importers, say in Ghana. Um, what would I need to find yeah. out? Um, there is two aspects to this because we know you can't deploy a blockchain immediately across the continent straight away. You know you've got yeah, to actually course. interface interface with existing uh, regulation and agencies and all the rest. So that's a perfect use mm -hmm. case for a Tala to actually do that. That might be an exploratory proposal to really just reach out to um, the various players within a supply chain find out where they're at with using something, using the what's referred to as the self-sovereign identity uh, technology. Um, most people, when they talk about this uh, Atala Prism or um, self-sovereign identity, they think of individuals, but as I said earlier, it's directly applicable to, um, to people, natural persons, legal persons, agencies, organizations, uh, mm -hmm. things, documents, a whole lot of different things you can apply it to. Um, so that's kind of the part one of the space I'll, um, I would consider. Um, I also know that uh, Shruti Apia, who's the head of engineering, I think, in IOG, um, she's interested in developing um, uh, DSLs, and, uh, which are domain-specific languages. So Marlow, for example, is a domain-specific language. It's actually designed for analysts, business people, to form their own contracts without a smart, they don't need to be Plutus engineers. Okay. Right. Yeah, Literally someone, sense. someone like you should be able to, if you are comfortable using Excel, right? You should be mm -hmm. able to go in and program a a peer-to-peer uh, -peer or Two part, it's basically designed for two party contracts, right? Um, it's fundamentally looking at Actus, which is the financing side of contracts, but it would be interesting to do some explorations on how could you take Marlow and what would the contracts look like for um, you know, this context of doing this. Um, mm -hmm. But she's also looking at um, how can they do a DSL specifically for trade finance? Okay. That's one of the domains okay. that they're interested in. Uh, well, yeah. Um, all right. I mean, without soaking up too much more time for uh, the others to have their um, sort of stuff, uh, um, would I be able to engage with her maybe just on that? Or do you think I can just do some research on the DSLs and then we can make- I, I would just, um, in terms of like the proposal and stuff like that, um, uh, I would just look mostly just at um, the Atala Prism side of things um, mm, okay. and uh, to begin with, but I know others in the room here might have some other suggestions of how to break the yep. proposal down into a few pieces uh, and have it check out Marlow. I would check that out and have a little play around with it. But um, okay. yep. that would... Just, just, uh, can yeah. I just say something? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Surely, surely part of this would be a, a search engine that the, the manufacturers and importers can sort of, uh, importers go into a search engine and find a product on this database? Well, um, yeah, it depends what angle you're coming from. I mean, I like the idea, for example, if you're a, um, uh, let's say, a brand in, um, uh, I don't know, let's say Ghana again, for, and, and you want to, look for distributors in um, Burkina Faso, Mali, or you want to go to North Africa, you could have a search functionality there that would list yeah. them. Um, there could also be some sort of, um, whether it's a, um, um, what do you call it? You'd, you'd, have, have, have you'd have to have, have products, products that I can see, you know, the guy can, he's looking for a product made in Ghana and he wants to ship it across to yeah. you. 
Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, if you're uh, if you're a distributor um, and you're looking for, let's say, juices, um, you can you can do a, you can do a search and say, okay, there's a you know South African juice company or there's a um, Ivory a juice company in Ivory Coast where I can uh, complement my portfolio for you know Nigeria and um, Cameroon and so on. So you're right, right. Uh, Red. There there could be search functionality in there, but also. Um, you know, there could be uh, some sort of uh, performance metric thing, you know, like reviews of, you know, there could be ratings and all sorts of things that apply right. to distributors. You know, there could be a level five distributor because, you know, 10 of their brand uh, partners have said they're, they're doing a great job, in which case um, they can do some sort of sorting um, on that from that point of view. So it's, uh, I guess, the, once the platform's developed, it's quite multi multi-dimensional. Yeah, I was just... Um thinking about something but um that is related to this is actually you i wonder if you could take um this would be quite an interesting exercise uh take the verified or organizational network which the canadian government developed um and uh to um this is related to digital identity it's based on the soren network but um uh, this sort of stuff is very similar to what you're trying to do because it's designed to actually create digital identities for different organizations across Canada. Um, this same sort of technology could be applied to obviously the manufacturers and importers. Simon, you got your hand up. Um, yeah, I mean, that is not related to what, what you were just saying, but I'm just curious about the traceability solutions. Um, yeah. Like, could, could that, because you don't really know, like on the blockchain, there's only the, like the, the path to, to the, well, like the dis distributor's path, but uh, could this also translate somehow into a social good for the people on the ground, uh, for the manufacturers like uh, fair trade or uh, like reducing child labor or something like that. Sorry, Robert, did you want to? I can, I can answer it, but if you want, I, I yeah. can. Yeah, I, um, I mean, yeah. let me just uh, yeah. sort of touch on that because um, it's good to think through it and then say something because you'll learn something by through your own thoughts. But hmm. um, yeah, I guess so um, on the ground, yeah, the product uh, where it's coming from could be noted in terms of fair trade um, status or um, across any dimension um, so that that information gets to the ultimate consumers. But uh, I guess, Robert, you'll, you'll be able to answer that much more competently than me. Um, with the main thing here is, yeah, you, you're quite right, Bob, and you can reflect any sort of attribute at all that you wanted. The thing is the, the uh, back end of it, which is doing that compliance, so to speak, um, to say that it's fair trade, uh, and who, in this case here, if we we're just talking about a Tala Prism, then who gets to issue the credential to say it was fair trade or it's been, um, you know, you've had an audit on labour practices, those sort of things. Uh, but certainly we can, um, you can, once you've got that information, you can make sure that the information is, has not been modified and a time at which it was put in, right? Um, so, uh, that's cool. And that's what I meant by trusted facts in terms of the blockchain. But if you're putting garbage in, it's garbage out, right? Um, so a lot of the, the work in doing things like um, uh, the practices of la labor reporting and things requires quite a bit of uh, heavy human machinery to actually get that done right and done well. Um, and uh, so in you know, the UN and various other different organizations throughout Africa attempt to do that sort of thing. Um, the, once you've got it in that blockchain, obviously, you know, um, it's, this, is a, this is the challenge with a lot of digital identity solutions or any claim verification sort of stuff is um, that, okay, we've got this fact, we've got this thing that says the labor practices associated with this product are good, right? Then you've got the second problem because it's a two-sided or multi-sided market in many cases is the consumers themselves have got to be able to trust and verify that in some way. 
but most that's that last mile problem was actually the biggest <laughs> biggest problem that's even harder yeah exactly that what that's what i was referring to really like how can blockchain um you know help us that is or is that even like can can, can even help us that it, it can help it and as and as, as much as we've got this trusted fact um but for consumers here, like, for example, we can slap a QR code onto a product. Um, but there's this, there's this wonderful phrase that I always liked when I was in China, which is, uh, you know, if you cross the borders between um, Hong Kong and Shenzhen or go across to Zhuhai or something else like that, there's all these manufactured goods and like iPhones galore and goodness. And then uh, right underneath these big banners that says, copyright and you know is a crime or something just like that and you walk up to these sellers and you go oh is that a an original iphone and they'll go original copy yeah <laughs> quite right <laughs> it's 100 <laughs> correct um so the thing is you can um anything if it can be manufactured it can be copied um and so uh, for example um from a, a New Zealand point of view, is um, Fonterra was uh, our makes um, milk powder, uh, and for many years in China there was actually a second secondary market for the milk powder cans um, of the various different brands, because all they'd do is just fill them up with the local um, local milk powder and reseal them and put them back up. So. <laughs> So my point here is that in order to to get consumers to trust things uh, and the last and, and the um, to the shelf um, kind of point of purchase um, requires actually quite also quite a lot of on the ground confidence. Um, there is technology that can help us, uh, and unfortunately, most of that technology though most people won't use. So we could put slap QR codes, but they're really easy to copy. They're re re really easy to put over the top. The better one is to use things like um, NFC tags, for the secure ones. They're, they're not impossible to copy, but they're more costly to do so. And that's the sort of thing that you go, and once you, you know, um, you could go off and tap a, a tag that's on a bottle of wine or in the case of the one that one has put in um, where they're using a teller scan, scan um, you can pop those onto the bottles, check it. Um, and then um, you, know, you go through and um, there's software in between that will basically say, yeah, this is good or this is crap. Uh, yeah, they've got a lot of the nano sort of neural um, chips and stuff that they, they can plug into different products to um, look at where the products are, how much are moving and temperatures and all sorts of things. So that technology has come quite quite some distance in the last five, 10 years, I guess. Yeah, there's, there's different, all sorts of different ones. Um, there's laser etching, there's all sorts of different techniques for, for product authenticity. Uh, which is, mm -hmm. you know, in the FMCG sector is quite a big thing um, yeah. on, on that kind of thing. Tifo, you had your hand up. Yeah, uh, I was thinking about, like, what one thing, what these NFTs bring us uh, is, from what, what are on our wallet, is that they create a sum object where he quantifies his uh, trust every time he uh, confirms something, signs something. And, and the one day you will, you don't maybe know the person or who is using his signature to verify an action or package or whatever QR code, what comes to his doorstep. It, it will create like this interesting trust where you can pick up, okay, when I want to move this, I can, Use that NFT, that NFT, that NFT, and, and wait for their verification before the money move, is moved across the network. And 
insurance is interesting from that part, but um, I, I, I like to do stuff and insure them. Yeah, so definitely you can build up all the traces and we can analyze those traces um, as, as we build them up over time. And when you start to interconnect the little traces of things going on, the uh, certainty of using that information gets stronger and stronger over time. So again, trust overall is an emergent property of the system, right? And it occurs at lots of different levels, right? We've, but because we've got um, a base layer, base layer of structure that says these, this 16 kilobytes of data can be trusted, which is the trans maximum transaction size. Um, and the linkages between this 16 kilobytes and the next one, or the, I mean, so the previous one and on, is, can be trusted, okay? Because we know it was verified. From that, we then start to build up other structures over the top of it that can be trusted and so on um, over time. And that's a, when, like in the case here, Bob, and in terms of what you're looking at with the, uh, building a network for distribution, it's a perfect case of where um, that idea of emergent trust um, builds up, goes up the stack, so to speak, um, and adds significant value. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, great. Um, thanks for all the feedback um, and uh, uh, questions and so on. I appreciate it. Uh, I mean, I've taken up quite a bit of time from others as well, but um, look, there's a, there's a lot there for me to um, follow up on, and um, I'll do that, and then we can catch up next week or whatever, and we'll take it from there. Yeah. I mean, is there any other suggestions on what Bob and could look at with respect to uh, what challenges and stuff that he could put? I mean, you're not limited to doing one proposal. You can do multiple. Yeah. Um, I was just going to ask, Robert, are you aware of any proposal that's uh, either in the same space or in a complementing area? Because for sure, uh, the scale of this is quite broad. And one thing I want to do is build up how, how it can scale in a modular manner. You know, so what's the, the, the first layer? And then how does it grow, not just geographically, but more in terms of the value added services, you know, in year five and year seven, 10 and so on. So, but uh, yeah, is there anything, any others that maybe well, we can um, collaborate? Uh, Juan has put in, a, did you put in a link one to, um, yes, to uh, the use of a Tala scan, which is one of the IOG products for product traceability. Um, and um, they, uh, Mergo's also got a um, supply chain uh, product uh, that they've been doing across Indonesia. Uh, I can't remember the name of it, unfortunately. Okay. Um, but if you do a Mergo uh, scan, they've got that. Um, and I mean, that might be from a traceability point of view, looking at one of those things to start with. And so can, can I, um, you know, deploy those into the market somewhere? Right. Okay. Um, and somehow. All right. Uh, and I haven't, I haven't seen any in the FMCG sector in terms of trying to build a distribution network at all, um, which is your key, to me, is your key point, uh, key advantage in terms of others. Because you're act in that case there, if you're actually trying to do, uh, you're actually literally trying to build a network. And so to mm -hmm, me, yeah. a, a network technology um, such as a blockchain is a perfect fit for that sort of situation. And it also opens the door for actual proper token engineering sort of work where there's yeah. actually good value. And you can certainly leverage things like a Tyler Prism or NFTs, which is what TV, TiVo was hinting at um, yeah. and other sort of forms of metadata that's in it. Hmm. Well, so I guess one, one of the way it would evolve would be um, the uh, manufacturer to distributor and then the distributor to retail and then retail to consumer. So we can over, you know, um, in, in uh, phases, take the whole chain somehow into the, mm -hmm. the whole um, uh, sort of chain into the blockchain. But All right, yeah. look, thank you very much. I won't hold up um, others, but I do appreciate it. And um, yeah, I look forward to catching up again next week. I mean, no, I'll that's, be that's... here for the rest of the discussion for sure. Yeah, no, that's all, that's all good. It's, a, it's good to see examples and talk through and, and see how it yeah. can be actually used. I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. so... Um, 
uh, Simon, you were, you know, obviously the um, climate related stuff. One of the other aspects um, is not just on the reporting and the verification side of things, but um, yeah, you were talking earlier around incentives. And um, there's two things in this um, that I'm interested in. Uh, first of all, obviously incentives. How, how would you see something with what Baldwin is doing in terms of his incentives being applied at the consumer end? Oh, so you mean something like Baldwin is doing? Yeah, well, like, so he's planning on doing, you know, ultimately a network fast measure and consumer goods, which is consumers going in and consumers being more aware about labeling and those sort of things. Um, we've got verification side of things, but what other might you think in terms of incentives can go along with the information? I, um, when you're in a, um, a network like this, what other sort of information might be useful to enable incentives for behavioral change? Make any sense? No? Mm -hmm. <laughs> not, not sure if I understand the question right. Okay. I, I was just wondering if you um, had any thoughts on how you would, how would you incorporate incentives into the information packet that is traveling along with a good through a supply chain like this to reach the end consumer oh, um, that can incentivize them. Yeah. I guess, I mean, like the, the one of the interesting things is, uh, you know, law is, uh, code is law, right? So if you, I mean, I, I'm sure, like you can build a lot of logic into a smart contract or what, what, whatever, right? So I, I'm, Feel like the the possibilities, you know, they're just bound by your imagination, really, since it's logic that you're building into the smart contract. So yeah, I, I mean, like I, I don't have the answer to that. I think what's very interesting is what what I saw in the climate change space is you have NFTs that are sold for uh, social good. So you they you can buy an NFT and then they plant a tree for you and the NFT might gain in value. So you're making basically an investment, which is a monetary incentive for you to buy this and also do a social good in the well, well doing so. Uh, I, would, I would say in Bobbin's case, uh, people who uh, want to manufacture, you want to register the their goods on the network would have to buy, pay with uh, ADA token, something like that. So, so yes. Maybe, sorry, carry on. Uh, I just said that um, if you wanted to tokenize uh, Bobbin's network, people would have to pay for the service of, of linking manufacturers and distributors and the manufacturer would have to pay a certain amount of ADA to put their goods on the actual network. And uh, when the distributors were searching for something, um, just like we all have to put pay money to Google to keep your product on Google or whatever, that sort of thing. I, it's certainly like, um, I don't know if they still do it, but uh, Alibaba, when they started out, I presume they still do it. They went through a whole lot of, they've got a whole, kind of um, auditing process and online you can have a badge to say when you were last audited and I think there's a requirement every two years and you could be a gold member or anything else like that and you paid paid for it basically to be listed um, so there's definitely opportunity to to do that um, as the network grows in size um, challenges with these sort of uh, B2B sort of marketplaces is getting them started. So you've got to come up with a good strategy in terms of how you kickstart both supply and demand, um, whether you're dealing with a supplier or manufacturer, because they say, well, I'm, I'm a manufacturer of X, 
why would I want to give you a thousand bucks to come and audit me just so that you can issue me an NFT? So, yeah, to begin with, you've got to build that out on, on that side of things. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, any sort of other questions or anything that uh, people are itching to have answered or addressed or want to talk about? Not questions, even... Um, things that are interesting at the moment oh i saw a i saw a, a thing called raven decks i don't know if you saw that it's a it's a look i'm not an expert at this i think it's like a exchange a decentralized exchange on cardano it's called raven decks and um they they came through one of the one of the things I read up and, and you could go onto their website and you could buy a portion of their business with for a fraction of an ADA type of thing. Don't know if you've heard of Raven Dex. No. No, I haven't heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. So I, it's, just, I just, just, it's just something something coming off the Cardano platform ecosystem. Yeah. Well um... uh, there's quite a few uh, few that are going to be come popping along, I think, coming along um, yeah. and offering to do token drops at some point or another. Um, I don't actually track them that much at all, <laughs> in fact. Um, so just, uh, just, just reading about crypto and these things pop up and you have a look and, oh, it's not a bad idea. And you pay next to nothing for them. So who knows what they'll be like in a couple of years' time. Yeah, take a punt. Yeah, <laughs> yeah take exactly. a punt. You're, you're taking a punt on. But um, uh, Robert, uh, I was going to ask about the challenges for Fund Seven. Um, there's, from what I understand, there'll be six or seven broad areas for the proposers to work within. Have they been set for Fund Seven yet, or not? Or well, that's that was uh, the back end of Fund Six to set them for the next one, right? There'll there'll be a lot more than six or seven. Um, I don't know. Oh, how, okay. Um, what was the challenge? The challenge pool, I think, community because it's called community challenge settings, and the total pool is yep. about five million dollars, right? That's available. So uh, we, as voters, which we've just finished, uh, hopefully everyone voted. Everyone voted. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, we'll have gone through and picked uh, the challenges that we thought was appropriate for Fund Seven. Um, so. Okay. Um, it's this is the first one where the community gets to pick the lot. Um, in a oh, sense. okay. Right. Uh, however, yeah, I think there'll be certain ones like the developer ecosystem. There's probably going to be the Atala Prism one. There'll probably be the metadata one, as I'm guessing, but I don't actually know until we see what uh, uh, voting comes through. The the snail challenge for the climate uh, climate one. That's a <laughs> challenge setting for. For um, for Fund Seven as well, I think you've got that at about a hundred thousand, isn't it, or two hundred thousand? Is the total pool for that one, Simon? I can't remember. Um, I think it's a hundred and sixty thousand, a hundred and seventy thousand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that's uh, the challenges themselves kind of define the types of proposals that go into them. Okay, so yeah, yeah. the Atala Prism uh, did the mass adoption challenge. If it gets voted in Fund 7, is about how do you get people using this Atala Prism technology? Um, another, sorry. Yeah. Uh, it is 270. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the other one is like that's relevant to you would be the metadata challenge. Um, you know, how an example of a proposal that could go in there is. How do we codify a particular type of uh, document, for example, that's part of the supply chain would be a useful one. Um, and what else? There'll be, there's the, so, so there'll be more than six, there'll be a whole lot. If you look through the fun six challenge setting challenge, um, mm -hmm. which um, I'll throw up, uh, you'll get an idea of the types of challenges that are in there, um, they're coming through. In that area, yeah, and I, yeah, I think um, you, mentioned, you mentioned last time there'll be one similar to Grow Africa, Grow Cardano, where 
this solution would would uh, fit in nicely, though I guess. Uh, yeah, my proposal yeah. would fit in nicely. Yeah, and as as I said to you before, you could actually do a few. Um, you don't have to just do one. You could do a few that are related and touching on different areas of what you think you want mm. to learn. It's a discovery platform overall. So you're trying to learn something about how to apply Kadano's network and community. It's not just the technology, it's also the people uh, to yeah. solve problems um, in, in the space. Tivo. There is something I have noticed that it is, if, you, you can start the proposal without looking into what challenge you do. I, I know it sounds weird, but in a sense that the goal here is to uh, take, like module up your problems, like uh, do you want to distribution first, do you have analytic problems, and you take this, like building a database problem, we, have, we don't have it. So you, you go into and, and like, analyze this like what is the problem here how do i solve it what tools i use what people i need how much it could cost what would be the next steps if and what would be the like, first delivery of, of the minimum viable product and you create your modular setup to 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 have the network and when the challenges come up then you go through all of them and then you think okay what could be the most likely place to put and and then you refine your proposal again uh, to to add more kpis or the slightly notch but if so this yeah because sometimes you feel fell into a trap where you look at the uh, challenge you think okay here is the most money and seems like i could put it there and when you start doing it you kind of like corrupt your uh original idea yeah fair enough yeah no i, th I think it uh, makes sense to uh, build it up uh, with a clear mind on what the problem is what solution you're trying to you know what solution you want to put out there and then uh tweak it you know adjust it depending on what the challenge uh, specifics are yeah so fair enough yeah so anything else go on. I um yeah. I'll, I'll 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 probably do a try and develop or try and develop sort of like a slide thing with my uh, insight is it insight offering uh, for the next Saturday. Uh, yeah, so we'll be because we're moving to every two weeks now. So uh, the next time will be November the sixth when we do okay. things again. So that gives you two weeks, right? Two weeks to do it. Okay, <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, actually, when does the results of the voting come out? About then is uh, 11th, uh, 11th or somewhere okay. around there, I think. Um, but the results are coming on the 11th of November. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, when when do the results yeah, of fun six? I, I heard I heard they come out next week. But... Oh, yeah, okay. Right here. So then we'll be able to answer the challenges that you have <laughs> in two weeks' time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, let's see. I hope uh, because we uh, wrote the uh, the proposal in like uh, a week. Like Melanie uh, set up the the proposal the, the night before uh, submission stopped, and then we had I think a week to to finish it. So it was in a hurry and there was not a lot of feedback, unfortunately. But yeah, I think I think we did pretty good. And uh, yeah, I hope like the small problems that we we found later on, I hope we can, you know, somehow straighten them out or at least straighten them out for the next one. Yeah, I reached next out to uh, um, Melanie reached out to me in terms of like um because I've got that grow. Uh, social and environmental finance challenge up on um, as well. And so she reached out with, to me to try and um, coordinate something around that. And I said, well, we can start working on those sort of things. And Sophie had um, also reached out earlier, but didn't, there was so much going on with all the stuff in Fun 6. It um, ran out of time, really. But I, I haven't noticed, but 
uh, in Catalyst program, the one or two of the in-chain sharing steps is to uh, improve challenge setting or, or like add more information about the challenge itself. H have you noticed, has anybody noticed, because I haven't, that the challenge brief is being changed right before proposal submission? How was it? I didn't notice that. I, I mean, but, but in my mind, it seems like the internet sharing is like a continuous, like crowdsourcing, co like improving the challenge itself. So, so I've been looking. At, I've been looking at a lot of the reporting stuff just over the last few days um, in terms of like cohort reporting funding, um, and uh, one of the things that. Um, occurred to me as soon as I sort of started looking at it, I said, well, actually, what is the purpose of, what is Catalyst? What's the purpose of it? What, you know, because if you're trying to report on cohort, uh, fund the cohorts, you go, so, well, actually, what are we auditing? What, what are we reporting over? And what are we trying to achieve? And that's why I sort of realized that actually the way to sort of look at uh, Catalyst itself, at least at the moment, is as this, discovery engine uh, or ecosystem and out of that looking into it, it was like actually the challenges are the most important component of it because that helps us set direction you know, we don't know we don't know what um, uh, we, we do not know um, how to apply this technology this blockchain technology right, to real problems we, we're all guessing um and so we've got to go around and kind of like uh, explore and um the challenges themselves kind of set a particular directional purpose and so therefore um actually trying to get those challenges really really well done um needs to be refined quite a lot uh, and improved quite a lot so one of the thinking there was that um uh, looking at it was okay well let's try and find some archetypes so uh, Lucio I think has thrown out a, a survey to all the CAs to try and come up with just a one word one or two word label for each of the funded proposals at the moment yeah, um, yeah so that we can basically work out um, uh, what sort of proposal is this? Is this a, a, an event pro proposal? Is this a SDK for software development? Is this um, an education proposal? And as a result of that, um, we can start to build up common patterns and, um, uh, and uh, good types of metrics, or more specifically, um, objectives and key results. Uh, for a discovery engine, for this discovery system. Right? I should stop using engine because it's more of an ecosystem, but this idea of uh, discovery ecosystem um, so that we know whether we're succeeding or not. And Stephen, who's in the room here, quite throwing some things up here, is one of the key drivers behind doing the auditing of, of all of that work and trying to think about it. Uh, because we can, it's not quite the same as like doing KPIs over a business and your target or anything else like that. Because we're trying to discover an experiment, we have to tolerate failure. We have to tolerate these experiments, but failure in the sense as long as we actually learn from them. And so that, again, the refinement and the uh, way in which we construct the challenge settings, I think is going to, is really, really important. So that's, what, that's a little, little rant. <laughs> no, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, you need that. <laughs> um, so, um, anything else? Yeah, you're, 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 you're smiling away there, TiVo, into the sunshine. <laughs> and, uh, sorry, sorry, TiVo, but. I just wanted to say that is like that is um, that is what I meant. This like you, you, like the, you can put in there 
but like the limits are your imagination, right? Yeah, so we're still experimenting. Like it's not it's not set in stone yet. Like what, what how we do it? Like I, there's so much uh, you can do, and it's such an abstract. Um, you know, programming itself is, is really abstract, and you can yeah, we can invent on that. And I hope people invent on that and we find like the way where where uh, you know social good goes together with um with financial well-being yeah so um this sort of touches on another point too and you know uh bob and with sharing what you're going through and thinking and stuff is actually really really valuable it's really valuable to all of us because it gets us thinking it gets us trying to understand how we can use this stuff and share the knowledge that's going around and that's a key component of all of this. You know, we could take all these little bits of facts and stitch them together and mm -hmm. um, uh, figure out and try and solve problems together. And this is particularly relevant to climate related and social inequality sort of issues, which are, you know, um, really, I would argue, is not an incentive problem, which was a point I was going to raise earlier. Um, but actually a institutional problem. And by that means, I mean, the rules of the game that have been played, the, the organizations, the rules, the approaches, how we do things. So for example, if Bob, Bob was able to get off the uh, FMCG uh, distribution network, then he can change that institution quite significantly in a number of ways. Um, he can change the rules of that game by lowering the financing costs. Um, but we can also make sure that, like you said, getting local manufacturers and that builds local resilience and wealth within the, the country itself, rather than always having to pull stuff in, say, from overseas or from China or whatever. Yeah, and that has, exactly. That has significant impact, not just for the well-being of people within the local communities or, or countries around them, but it also obviously pre reduces the amount of transportation costs and things like that, and therefore the impacts that that has on the environment overall. Um, and wastage would also go down quite significantly as a result. So there's all these sort of factors that we can change the game that we're playing um, by change, uh, by being more efficient in these facts. Um, and yeah, I think- Yeah, I guess I did. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry Robert, go, go on. Go on. No, you go, Bob. Yeah, I guess I didn't um, emphasize that point enough um, that local manufacturing um, linking the vast uh, capacities of local manufacturing across the African continent with distributors that can help and market and move their products uh, has quite wide ranging positive ramifications through the community and, and the African society and so on. Also from an environmental point of view in terms, you don't have ships coming in from Europe and from all over the place. Um, you know, you could talk about, you know, local, um, local fruits and becoming local Local juices becoming local brands going in through you know through Africa. So a lot of the value chain stays local, you know, um, and uh, rather than you know just shipping in um, sort of dairy products from Den from um, Holland or whatever or Denmark or whatever. So uh, yeah, I think there's huge uh, aspects to that, and it can start from day one as a, as you said, like a highly climate sort of centric and social inequality based. In, um, in the way that it, that it lives and breathes and um, the values that it sort of uh, propagates. So I think that's that's one big part of it for sure. Hmm. Uh, so in terms of, we can only go so far with um, individual incentives, but we can go a lot further by basically changing the rules of the game that we're playing on that side of things. And um, so, Anyway, if any other sort of burning questions or we've been at it for nearly two hours, so almost two hours and stuff like that, and I uh, yep. will probably, it's getting to 12 o'clock and I've got to get up apparently at six. Uh, for yeah. well, well. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's Saturday night in Melbourne, so I'm going to go have a beer as well. Oh, there you go. So. <laughs> You're doing well. Um, well, thank you very much for coming along and thank you, Bob, for sharing and stuff like that on, uh, in terms of what you're doing. So hopefully it was worthwhile for you. But, uh, yeah, for sure. Thank we'll you very much. See you again. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. Yeah. Cheers. See you later, guys. Bye-bye. Okay. See you, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.